The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the second NISAL webinar for 2018. And this is Karen Rollins speaking from the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health at the University of Georgia. We are hosting the webinars um, with uh, the National IPSI. And speaking first will be Alan, and I'm sorry, Alan, if I mispronounce your name, Cleus and Joe Pinesco. And our overall talk, topic will be legal issues surrounding invasive species management. And after Alan and Joe, Helen Spites will speak, and then Stephanie Otts. And I'm turning the time over now to Joe and Alan. And I, Joe and Alan, I still can't hear you. Okay, and I do have your PowerPoint up, um, and this is showing from your screen through the webinar. However, I'm not getting sound from y'all, and I'm not showing you. Um, in the chat box, um, attendees, would you let me know if you can hear the speakers? Karen, I don't know if it would help. This is Stephanie. We can switch the order and I could go first while they work on their connections. Okay. Um, Joe and Alan. Okay. Uh, can you hear us now? Yes, we can. Oh, hi, Joe. Yes. <laughs> we, we used the wrong pen, audio pen, when uh, we first dialed. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so, yeah, we're here together and, and ready to go. So, I'll turn it over to Alan first. All right. Great. Yeah, so my name is Alan Ployce. I'm with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And uh, we're just going to give you a brief overview of the Vessel Incidental Discharge Act uh, as it's uh, currently uh, in play. Uh, primarily, we'll be talking about the version Senate Bill 168. All right. And we're looking down lower. There we there go. You go. So this uh, slide two talks a little bit about the, the history here. There's, it's pretty complex, but basically back in 19, uh, the mid-1980s, we had zebra mussels come into the Great Lakes. That's down in the lower left in red. That uh, triggered off a lot of different issues um, and started the whole process for ballast water management, primarily through the uh, National uh, Aquatic Nuisance Prevention and Control Act of 1990. And uh, that was further, uh, a new version came out, uh, National Incidental, National Invasive Species Act of 1996. Um, those uh, directed the Coast Guard to start doing ballast water management in the United States. Uh, primarily, they were a voluntary um, ballast water exchange up until 2004 when the Coast Guard made ballast water management a uh, national requirement for ballast water exchange. States that were also uh, became players in ballast water management that in the 2000-2004 uh, era, primarily Washington, California, Hawaii, Oregon. I didn't, I don't mention uh, the Great Lakes states in here, but that was uh, about the time when uh, Great Lakes started getting in, involved and having their own programs as well. Uh, primarily because the federal uh, re requirements were not sufficiently protective of our state water resources. So uh, along that line, a lawsuit was filed in 2008 uh, against the um, Environmental Protection Agency. That lawsuit was uh, came to fruition in 2008 when EPA was directed to also manage ballast water as well as other incidental discharge um, stream. So in 2008, they came out with their first vessel general permit 
and it had very a lot of similarities to the Coast Guard requirements, but uh, of course some more um, permit uh, reporting issues that were not re required under the Coast Guard. So also uh, in 2005, that's when Congress started um, putting out new bills uh, to try and subjugate or preempt state rights from managing ballast water. So back in 2005, Senate Bill 363 was one that sort of kicked it all off. And since then, um, there has been numerous um, congressional acts trying to deal with vessel incidental discharges. That's in the, the last column under Congress in the blue type. Most currently, what we're dealing with right now is um, we have the Coast Guard re requirements, we have the EPA requirements, and we have several states that have uh, ballast water requirements. And uh, 2017 saw the, the most current version of VITA, Senate Bill 168. It was amended into Senate Bill 1129, which is the U.S. Coast Guard Authorization Act, but it was basically the same version as under 168. So affected states, uh, states with active ballast water management programs, there's about 10 of them right now, West Coast, Great Lakes, East Coast, and I define active by uh, mean, means that a state has issued and enforces one or more ballast water management requirements, or they enforce federal requirements for covered vessels. So there's really only a handful of states that actively uh, manage ballast water programs. As I noted, the um, the, there's num a number of incidental discharges that are also covered under VITA. Um, and uh, that, that applies to all states. So I, that was the, the third bullet. So the second bullet is which states act, have unique ballast water discharge standards different than the federal standard. And there's really only one that actively has a different one, and that's Michigan. California is currently using the federal standard, but they have a higher standard on standby uh, in 2020, but only if commercially there's treatment systems that are commercially available, uh, which at this point we would say would be highly unlikely. Next. So the key provisions under Senate Bill 168, um, covered vessels include all commercial and fishing vessels. Uh, it covers 36 incidental discharges, establishes a national uniform ballast water discharge standard. States can petition the Coast Guard to revise best management practices if on incidental discharges, if revision would substantially reduce adverse effects. So it's a pretty high standard. VITA would also eliminate all Clean Water Act uh, authorities. It establishes Coast Guard as the sole authority uh, and EPA under a con a consultation role in certain areas. It eliminates state regulatory authorities for all covered vessels and discharges and fully exempts commercial vessels less than 79 feet and all fishing vessels from any uh, federal or state management. Next. So just quickly, the definition of, um, in, uh, of incidental discharge is that if the discharge into the navigable waters of the United States from a commercial vessel of 36 different effluent streams. So this table uh, identifies those 36 uh, effluent streams. Um, so ballast water is the big one, upper left. Um, I, the ones that are in the, the reddish color are the big ones that affect invasive species. So ballast water is the, is the well-known one. Under sh underwater ship husbandry effluent, that's all the stuff you can scrape off the bottom of vessel, which is what we call biofouling, which science has shown is equal to, if not a greater pathway risk for invasive species on commercial vessels. There's also chain locker effluent down in the lower one. That's another one that we're concerned about for pathways of invasive species. The other ones are primarily water pollution issues and the two that I've highlighted in sort of a gray green anti-fouling hull coating leachate. So that's the stuff that, you know, you paint on the bottom of your hull to try to, pre to, try to prevent the biofouling 
and uh, a pollutant with connection, a pollutant in connection with the testing, maintenance, repair of a system, equipment, or engine. Very, very broad categories, um, which are not well defined under veto. You know what the extent they could be. So I'm going to hand it over to Joe now. <coughs> All right. Uh, VITA expressly addresses the scope of state rights. And in the second half of the slide, it expressly preempts them. But I'll, I'll talk about Section 10 first. Uh, it, this pretty much quotes it. The Secretary of Coast Guard may enter into an agreement with the governor of a state that would authorize the state to enforce the provisions of the act as the secretary considers appropriate. There's no further guidance there on what, uh, how much discretion the secretary would have to allow any state to do that. Uh, the, the preemption is under Section 11, and it is very express. It says, except as provided in Subsection B, and as necessary to implement an enforcement agreement addressed under Section 10, no state or political subdivision thereof may adopt or enforce any statute, regulation, or other requirement of the state or political subdivision with respect to all incidental discharges and ballast waters. Um, and as Alan just pointed out, the definition of discharge is huge, 30, 36 different categories. So it really does prevent states from, from doing uh, a lot of things that, at least in Washington state, that the state has been regulating thus far. Uh, we don't have it in the slide, but you know, it says except as provided in subsection B of section 11. That is a carve out and it is a carve out very narrowly uh, targeted towards land transport of vessel. So states that are concerned about smaller boats being trailered from one water body to another can still uh, implement their state authority for overland transport of vessels or any other um, equipment going from one water body to another to, to try to address that pathway. So the, the preemption focuses on, on the vessels in the water. Uh, the, the intent expressly preempt states here is 180 degrees contrary to Congress's intent uh, as spelled out in the Non-Indigenous Aquatic Nuisance Prevention and Control Act 1990. In that act, Section 1205 of the act was expressly clear that it was reserving and preserving and protecting the rights and authorities of states and political subdivision to adopt and enforce their own control measures to address, to address aquatic nuisance species. And every version of VITA that we've looked at has expressly gone into NANPACA and amended 1205 in a variety of fashions, but all of which were to ensure that the, the express preemption in VITA uh, carries forward, that states cannot rely upon the Section 1205 of NANPACA to, to do any state authority. Um, so the most recent version of S-168 that we've looked at is Section 12E, it's hiding in the very bottom of the bill under Section 12E that, that removes ballast water and incidental discharges from Section 1205 of NANPACA. VITA does have some exemptions, and that is under, oh, we forgot to write what section this was. Section 8. Eight. Section 8, okay. Um, yeah, uh, application of certain vessels. So no permits shall be required under the Clean Water Act, which is Section 402, um, or prohibition enforced under any other provision of law, nor shall any best management practices regarding discharges, incidental to norm of operations of vessels under this title, apply to the discharges incidental to commercial vessels if they are less than 79 feet in length or are fishing vessels. So this is a, a blanket exemption for vessels under 79 feet or commercial fishing vessels. And, and it's very broad, given the express preemption in this, this bill, coupled with this broad language of, you know, or prohibition enforced under any other provision of law, which arguably could cover state and local attempts to regulate as well. Um, so, so this leaves a gaping hole, which you know, EPA at the very bottom of the slide estimated could be about 120,000, 140,000 vessels. Alan, is there any breakdown across the states of that that number? No, it's, each state has a, a different number. You know, our coastal, our Washington state would have a lot of 
fishing vessels coming in, coastal states would have more of that, or in, but it would affect internal or interior states as well. So whatever meets that definition, barges, tugs, uh, other commercial fishing vessels that would probably be smaller would be affected by this. Right. Would be exempted. Would it be exempted? From, from, from control completely. Yep. Okay. So opposition. There has been a lot of opposition, but you know, it's, it's prevented the bill from from getting getting enacted thus far. But there are still repeated efforts in Congress to push it through, notwithstanding all this opposition. Uh, this is just some. National Governors Association sent a letter in May of 2017. I've got another slide that'll that'll touch on that. Uh, Ten states, including Washington State, sent a letter in February 2017. That's also on the next slide. Um, Ten senators. Uh, sent something, Western Governors Association, AFWA, multiple state natural resource agencies, and you know, on and on, tribes, 89 environmental groups, and, and many more. So, so there has been vocal opposition, but it, for, for whatever reason, it hasn't been enough to, to completely shut down this effort. This effort still has a lot of traction in Congress. Regarding the objection letters, so in February of 2017, uh, the 10 states are listed there sent an, an opposition letter to the, the committee chairs that were considering the bill. And, you know, the main points in that letter was they, they specified, talked about how given the massive economic and environmental harm that uh, an aquatic invasive species outbreak would, would impose on a state, the states really need to be able to maintain their own direct authority to, to deal with the problem. Um, it, it objected strenuously to the complete elimination of Clean Water Act protection and the transferring the control of the U.S. Coast Guard, which the letter points out uh, doesn't have water pollution expertise, and, and that's just not their mandate. Um, and, and why would this, should the states trust the U.S. Coast Guard picking this up when the states are, are, are boots on the ground already doing these types of programs? Um, and it also objects to the, the, pro, the provision that strips out the state authority under NAMPACA. The national governors uh, association objection letter was very short, um, also focused on S-168 and, and, you know, just straight up front said we completely object to the preemption of state authority. Uh, this should be a partnership, which, you know, how NANPACA was written, NANPACA was very clearly a partnership, and, and this letter says, yeah, we want to keep doing that, um, and they point out that, it, that the, the standards that VITA imposes on ballast water are are weak and wimpy and absolutely insufficient to protect our waters. So there's been various versions of, of VITA that have been, uh, you know, discussion drafts that have been circulated amongst uh, people but not publicly available. So these uh, accepted agreements are um, what we've heard that the Senate Commer Committee on Commerce, Science, and transportation majority has reportedly approved and we want to make sure that they there's no backsliding on that so some of the things that we that have been negotiated so far is that uh, best available technology economically achievable language has been inserted for consistency and application of Clean Water Act case law um, EPA's role has been enhanced in rate in their ability to um, raise the ballast water discharge standard uh, as well as in developing incidental discharge uh, best management practices. It has added West Coast state regional requirements into the federal law. So, for example, West Coast states require vessels to do a ballast water exchange for coastal voyages outside 50 nautical miles. That's been added um, to the, the negotiated version. Uh, it also requires the Coast Guard now to work cooperatively with the state. Uh, again, before it was May at the discretion of the Coast Guard, now it's definitely the Coast Guard has to work cooperatively with states to enforce federal requirements. Um, and then it keeps the state VGP authorities for incidental discharge active until the Coast Guard issued final rules. The previous, the, the original version would have basically preempted the states from um, enforcing incidental discharge regulations for, uh, during that gap. Was, wasn't there a fees provision as well that the states that had fees could still charge some fees? Yeah, and so that's that's been included, the authority to issue fees to fund regulatory programs. So that, that was a big give. Okay. But only if they have already pre-existing pre -existing fees. fees. Um, outstanding issues, uh, at least 
you know, the the exemption on the the small commercial vessels less than 79 feet and the all fishing vessels, that's a big one that I, I'm really scratching my head why uh, people aren't really, you know, really opposed to it. And that's one of the issues nationally that I think you know, really needs to be addressed. And I just want to make the caveat here that this presentation does not uh, attempt to uh, describe any of the Great Lakes or East Coast issues uh, or agreements that they've made uh, or outstanding issues. Yeah. That's it. We're available for questions. Okay. And um, Joe and Alan, if it's okay with you, we will hold questions till the end. Um, are you guys able to hang out till then? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, then our next speaker will be uh, Helen, I think, if I've got. Okay, I do not see Helen signed in yet. So, Stephanie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, and I know Helen, I think, got sick yesterday. She was uh, trying to be on, but maybe she needed to go home. So that might explain why she hasn't logged in. Okay. And so you will be, now be presenter. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. And it is turned over to you. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give an update um, on the building consensus in the West um, activities that have been happening around the model legal framework for state watercraft inspection and decontamination programs. Um, I believe that this effort has been talked about before in previous NISAs and so wanted to give a little bit of background for those of you that might not be familiar with the effort, but try to talk a little bit about kind of where we are now and, you know, next steps for the future um, in case there's people who are interested in, in becoming involved. Um, but first, before I started, I just wanted to give a shout out for our partners and funders in the project. So the National Sea Grant Law Center has been um, leading this particular component of the building consensus work with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and Priya Ninjapa is our partner on that. Um, but this is happening within the context of the Western Regional Panel, um, who is kind of the home for the building consensus, consensus committee. But the work related to the model law um, and the legal framework has been funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so we're very um, grateful for their continued support that has allowed us to work uh, with the partners over several years. So this slide is just, I just include this to illustrate that although we have been working with the Western states to develop this framework, it is a national issue, issue um, with the trailering of recre recreational watercraft across the country. This image just shows the home residents of boaters that were coming into a watercraft inspection station in Idaho. Um, and so each pinpoint there is their home residence and how far they then trailered their boat <laughs> into Idaho um, when they were stopped at an inspection station um, for the invasive species checkpoint. So boats are traveling huge distances over land, um, many coming from the eastern United States where there are large populations of quagga and zebra mussels, um, of which are the primary concern um, currently for the western United States, although there are many other um, species that are moved in that pathway. And kind of keep this image in mind um, for then a couple slides when I talk about, you know, kind of what the current legal framework looks like. And this is the, the slide. So one of the places we started was to say, you know, what's out there, what's on the books um, on the state level with respect to recreational watercraft. And so 62% of the states do have some legal provisions addressing the trailered recreational watercraft vector. But you can see they are very concentrated um, geographically. Um, the big red uh, splotches there are um, 
states that don't have any relevant provisions. So these states may have invasive species programs, um, and they have a lot of you know state laws with respect to noxious weeds um, or restricted um, fish and animals, but they don't actually have provisions on the books specifically for the overland transport of watercraft. The states in green are states that have what we consider a full um, or, or um, partial watercraft inspection and decontamination program. And so these states are requiring that boats be clean, drain and dry, comply with inspection requirements such as stopping at stations that are manned by state personnel or trained volunteer to inspect the vessel to determine the risk that that vessel might be transporting invasive species. Um, and then there's a handful of states, those marked in blue uh, and purple, that either may restrict the movement of watercraft with um, aquatic plants attached, for instance, um, or maybe require drain plugs to be pulled so that the compartments are drained um, before they're moved to another water body. Um, some also have launch restrictions. For instance, they might prohibit the launch of a vessel that hasn't been um, drained or hasn't complied with state law. And then a couple of states New England, um, in New England, New Hampshire and Maine that have courtesy boat inspections. So these are voluntary programs run um, by volunteers primarily focused on outreach and education to get boaters to um, clean, drain and drive primarily and remove aquatic plants. So there's a whole range across the country of where states are. And the the Western states have really been trying to work towards some sort of framework that would allow recipro reciprocal acceptance of recreational watercraft coming through state checkpoints from low risk waters. Um, and so these are water um, boats that might not pose a high risk of invasive species introduction. The states still want to stop and look at those boats and talk to the operators as they're moving through the state, but um, they would like to try to get to where they could share resources among the states, maybe rely on some of the initial risk assessments that a previous state um, has looked at. If you think back to the map with the checkpoints, some of those uh, boaters are driving through four or five states on their way up to uh, Washington or Oregon. They may get stopped multiple times and so um, boaters would like to, you know, have similar, um, or the states would like boaters to experience similar interactions with their inspection personnel as they're moving through there. Um, and so they started with this idea of a model law as the foundation and then working towards a model regulation with model protocols and standards. Those are being developed by different committees within the building consensus initiative. Uh, Many of the documents that have been produced through those committees are issued by the Pacific States Marine Fishery Commission, um, and they have that type of um, scientific analysis going behind the protocols and standards, and then ultimately working towards a model memorandum of agreement that states could use if they wish to work together. Now, one of the unique aspects we think of the Building Consensus Initiative is that it has been focused on building policy consensus to be that foundation for the legal framework. And it's done by bringing together three groups of people who are not often brought together in the same room. And that's the AIS coordinators who are the kind of subject matter experts. They're the ones on the ground working in the agencies to implement the programs, but we bring them together with assistant attorneys generals from the state and law enforcement so that we have the folks that are either writing or providing advice on implementation of the law with the enforcement officials as well as the subject matter experts. And 
we're doing this because we think it's important um, mechanism to enhance the intra and interstate cooperation and communication. Um, it, you really need to get everyone in your state on the same page about what your policy goals are before you can then start working across state lines. And then when you're ready to work across state lines, everybody needs to be talking in the same language and also um, trying to work towards similar goals. Um, no one's going to be identical, but you are all trying to row in the same direction. And so the foundation of the effort is to try to harmonize state laws, regulations, and policies, enhance implementation and enforcement through reciprocity or other agreements, and to also help coordinate the outreach uh, messaging. The how, so the role that the National Secret Law Center has been playing is to provide information to support these discussions and to provide resources for the states and their partners as they try to move forward. So we have done research on the existing legal framework for watercraft inspection and decontamination programs in the Western United States, but we've also, as the graphic from earlier slides illustrated started to look at programs nationwide and so we do also compile information on the laws and regulations in the eastern and the Great Lakes states and then we look at the legal barriers whether those are real or perceived to interstate cooperation and bring people together to talk about how to overcome those barriers. Um, and then we have also developed and maintained a compilation of state laws that are relevant to these programs so that when states are undertaking legal reform efforts, they have a resource that they can come to um, to answer questions of state legislatures. Um, for instance, like if you're looking at drain plug uh, provisions, sometimes um, the legislature likes to know how many other states have taken a similar action. So our compilation can make it a little easier um, to timely produce that type of information. And then the building consensus initiative through uh, many different funding sources and just the generous in-kind support of all the states that have been involved have been able to facilitate a number of face-to-face -face meetings. Um, and we convene the AIS coordinators, assistant attorney generals, and law enforcement officials in the same room. Um, and they've all attended the different meetings at various levels. They don't all come to every meeting, but they're all involved in aspects of the discussions. Our first meeting was in Phoenix, Arizona in 2012. Then um, we've tried to meet every year um, as much as possible. We had a snowstorm, I think in 2016, that kind of threw us off. But um, we have managed to have sustained participation now for um, going on six years, which is pretty amazing um, that this state agencies um, have been so supportive of their um, staff participating in these discussions. And then this, the steps were once we, you know, got folks in the room and they were able to agree on some of the policies that they wanted to move forward, the question became how to translate that consensus policy into state law. And that's where the National Sea Grant Law Center and AFWA have been working to produce these resources. So the first one um, was the model legislation uh, that we issued in 2014. And um, like Joe Panesco, our former um, panelist, was involved in that effort along with several other assistant attorney generals from Western states. After we issued the model legislation, we started to get a lot of questions about, so where do states fall within this model, right? How close are states to the authorities? Um, what the model legislation does is outline model authorities that the group thought was necessary for state agencies to have in order to implement an effective watercraft inspection and decontamination program. Our documents are not intended to be adopted verbatim. In many cases, the states have lots of the pieces of the authority that we discuss, and we don't anticipate states going back and um, 
kind of wholesale revising their invasive species laws and policies. But what the objective is to is to provide model language or ways to think about how to provide authorities for different aspects of the program, such as training of personnel or where do you place your check stations, those type of conversations. And so we followed the model legislation up with a gap analysis where we looked at um, across the country, how did states match up to the model? which has just helped the states um, when they go into conversations about how they would like to change their legislation, they can kind of see where they might be missing things that a lot of other states have. That was followed up by a model regulation, which was issued in 2016. This stepped down the authorities that were outlined in the legislation to look at okay what do we need now that we're implementing the program and um, what do we need to make it easier to work across state lines and to work with partners in neighboring states and so the model regulation was really looking at how can you create or um, design a watercraft inspection program in such a way that might make it easier to work with your neighboring states. That was followed up by an update of the gap analysis because there were some provisions in the model regulations that were not talked about in the model legislative provisions. For instance, um, we added um, things related to training of personnel um, and drain plugs to the model regulation. So we wanted to go back and expand our gap analysis to cover you know, everything that we were talking about. And then this year, we're starting on the final piece of the model legal framework, which is the model MOU. And this will just be to outline things that states should consider if they want to enter into an agreement with a neighboring state or um, you know even a state a couple states away to share resources or work together to achieve their watercraft inspection goals we've actually had it's been amazing to see the states being able to use the resources that the building consensus initiative is adopting to move their programs forward so almost a dozen western states have amended their laws and regulations to incorporate consensus policies and model authorities and that can be seen through the updates in our gap analysis that we actually have more states with authorities that they didn't have before that they are adding um, because of the building consensus process. The model legislative provisions also inform development of the new watercraft inspection programs in several of the Western Canadian provinces. And so that was really helpful for them because they were able to come in or come online kind of consistent what with their neighbors to the south were doing, which has made it easier um, in some ways for them to join in the discussions and to um, kind of build off of the work that was already done. And then the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies issued a resolution in 2016 that has really helped to sustain the process as well because they recommended adoption of standardized regulations with respect to drain plugs and visible plant material on watercraft and trailers. And so that has been helpful to the state aquatic invasive species coordinators to have the support of their agencies in moving some of these reform efforts forward. So some of the next steps, as I mentioned, the development of the model MOU, but we are also working on professional development and training workshops for policymakers that may come in late 2018 or early 2019, depending on um, the timing of some meetings that we're looking at kind of coordinating with. But there we hope to bring in um, representatives from the Attorney General's offices, but also staff, legislative staff that might be working on legal reform efforts um, so that they could talk about what their challenges, what challenges remain, um, things that might be missing from the resource documents that could you know, help them move their um, programs forward. 
Um, we'll continue to update our comparison report as um, changes happen. The Western United States has been very active in um, amending their legislation and regulations, and it can sometimes be hard to keep up with everybody, but um, we continue to do as much as we can to make sure that our information is as current as possible so that the states can have that information at their fingertips if they need it. Um, we would also like to expand our legal compilation to include the Canadian provident, pro provinces so people have a little more access to that information. And there are some tribal governments that are implementing watercraft inspection and decontamination programs and their laws are a little more difficult at times to access and we would like to see our legal compilation be used to kind of move those um, en enhance accessibility of the tribal laws. And so uh, I encourage you to visit our project website where all of our documents are available. Um, if you have you know, any information that you would like to share with the Western states um, or would like more information about how we put the comparisons together or would you know, like information about kind of the committees and, and who was involved, I'm happy to talk at any time. And, uh, I think with that, we could open up with questions. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that, Stephanie. And I see that Helen um, is ready to do her presentation. Um, we're having a few issues, though. So while Helen is um, checking on um, an email I just sent her that should give her the information she needs, we'll check and see if there's other questions for um, the presenters that have gone already. Let's see. All right, if you have questions for um, the one of the three presenters that we've heard today already, if you would type that into the question box, then I will um, read that aloud for everyone. And I see, let me check. Okay, yep. I still don't have Helen. Um, Helen, we need you to sign in as a presenter. The last email that I just sent you, if you'll open that Excel file, that has the information for you to sign in as a presenter. And I think that's the issue because you're signed in as an attendee now. Um, while uh, we're waiting, I would like to thank the National Invasive Plant Council for arranging these webinars um, and uh, especially Sherry Williams. She did the vast bulk of the work for arranging everything, contacting the speakers and arranging the schedule. And we're very grateful to her for that. She's done a great job and got a great lineup of speakers. And thank you also to our speakers for that. This has been very interesting. Yesterday, talking about some of the tools that are now available to use in some areas and will eventually be available to use um, throughout the U.S. and Canada. And those are available now for the Southeast. And now we've looked at today some of the um, laws and other regulations that are being worked at together um, by the Western states to make things uh, more consistent across that, across that area and will hopefully be taken up by the um, Eastern part of the U.S. too. So it's, it's great partnership, everybody working together and learning from each other. Let me see if we've got Helen on yet. Okay, we've got one question. Um, says, I'm not in the industry, but curious how difficult enforcement is with recreational boat, um, boat owners. How do you catch them? Uh, 
Hi, this is Stephanie, and Alan would probably have a lot more specifics, but um, the image that I showed about the check station is they, most of the Western states strategically place inspection stations, so booth, or if you think about like a roving checkpoint for um, like when we think about drunk driving or alcohol checkpoints, the boat inspection stations are similar to that. They're either placed at a water body or maybe at a border station where boats, you know, and major highways where they're coming in. And so the idea is to try to kind of catch them as they're traveling along major transportation routes. And the laws in the Western states require boaters to stop at check stations when they're opened and being manned. Um, and there have been enforcement challenges um, over the years. Sometimes boaters will drive past them. Um, and so some states have had to go back and amend their laws to give um, lease and enforcement officials the ability to go and force a boater to come back to stop at the check station. Um, on a highway stop, for instance, it might be a little easier if you're stationed at a water body since they'd have to go past you to launch the boat. But um, I think that might be the kind of the basic approach to the question. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Um, and um, let's see, then we've got another question um, asking about the presentations. Yes, these presentations have been recorded and they um, will be available on the NESOC and the National EPSI websites by the end of the week. And all of the webinars this week will be uh, done that way. Um, okay, we're still having... Um, this is Helen, can you hear me? Yes, yay, Helen, I can hear Okay, me. well, yeah, at least you can hear me, that's a good sign. Okay. Um, um, yes, now if I can hear you, um, okay, I'm going to try to, all I'm seeing is Joe signed in. Okay, let me see if this will, I change presenter. Okay, I'm still not seeing, okay, let me see if this will let me do this. Hold on one second. I'm sorry for this, y'all, but technical difficulties do tend to arise with this technology. I'm going to see if I can do this to make Helen a presenter. Oops. Um, you need to enter your pin, Helen. There should have been a pin along with audio pin has been sent. So the <clears throat> the pin that was sent to me, um, I did enter the pin, a different pin, multiple times. I received several different emails with specific information, and okay. none of the pins apparently. Okay, uh, and I just, I just it, in the Excel spreadsheet that you sent me, that access code did enable me to have this audio, but there was no pin on that. And I've just clicked on your name and asked it to send you a pin, so. That may be, can you see us on the screen? Yeah, I've been able to see the screen the whole okay. time. Well, if you, is there an area there that says audio pin? Has a. Um, no. I'm not sure on your screen where it would be audio. It I'm would, seeing your, your audio. Um, hold on, let's see. Okay, yes. Okay, try that. Well, no, that's your screen. Um, when I click it, it says muted, enter audio pin, which I've already got audio. Um, and this is on your screen, so. Okay. Uh, I mean, I hate to take up everyone's time. I suppose I could, um, it, it's only seven slides. I suppose I could talk through it without it, but that's. I, I, I hate to do that. Um, I hate to do that. Oh, could she email your the slideshow? 
and yeah. and just direct you to click through the slides? Absolutely. As a matter of fact. Brilliant. Absolutely. Very brilliant. Okay, let me do that. Um, I will, I'm doing that now. I may have that. Let me check. I don't think you do. Okay. I, I mean, because I, I, I was out sick yesterday, and I wasn't sure how this was, unfortunately, all going to go down. Now I know. <laughs> so, uh, let me see. And you do have uh, Kay Rollins at uga.edu? Yes, I'm responding to to the when I sent you email that you just sent me. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. And then, there we go. All right. And what I'm going to do is tell it. I did send it, so just let me know. All right. And here it is. Oh, yay. All right. Um, and now the test. Can you all see mine? Okay, perfect. Um, can you see my screen? I can, yeah. Okay. Yeah, put put, put it to the, the, the view slideshow setting. Yeah. Um, and I'd also like to say that I have, I, I believe also on this webinar are um, Sue Jewell and Tim Van Norman at Fish and Wildlife Service. And Sue is the Fish and Wildlife Service's uh, injurious wildlife listing coordinator and Tim Van Norman is chief for the branch of permits within the Division of Management Authority and they were going to be online to um, respond to any questions with respect to how the service was responding and implementing this decision but now understanding the nature of, of this um, webinar it might I, I'm not sure that they would have any any audio to respond, you know, would they be able to be unmuted or would they be? Um, I, I think I can unmute them. Okay. Um, if, right. if, if you send them your sign in, they're signing in as a presenter and then they would be unmuted. But I think I can unmute individual attendees as well. And I'll say, okay, I think so by my sign in, do you mean the Excel spreadsheet? Because again, I got several different sign in emails, and the only one that gave me this audio was the, email, the Excel spreadsheet you just sent me. Right, so that would be the one to send them. Okay, okay, I'll do that while. So are you, okay, are y'all seeing the proper screen now? I am. Okay. Um, Sorry, give me just a minute to send this to them. Um, I'm not very great at multitasking, apparently. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, my name is Helen Spites, and I'm an attorney with the Department of Interior's Office of the Solicitor. I'm in the Division of Parks and Wildlife, uh, specifically in the branch of Fish and Wildlife. And I was asked today to discuss litigation filed by the United States Association of Reptile Keepers, or we always also call them U.S. ARC. Um, that litigation was challenging the Fish and Wildlife Service's listing of eight constrictor species as injurious under the Lacey Act. Uh, the central issue in this litigation it was whether the Lacey Act prohibited shipments of injurious wildlife from one of the 49 continental states to another. Uh, but before we get into the specifics of the litigation and, and that decision, I'd like to provide a little bit of background on the Lacey Act and the service's interpretation over the years. Uh, next slide. Um, it's being slow. Sorry. That's 
Okay. Okay, uh, the Lacey Act is a law that dates back to 1900 and is one of the oldest conservation laws in the United States. A central purpose of the Lacey Act is to regulate the introduction of American or foreign birds or animals in localities where they have not existed. At its en enactment, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1900, Section 2 of the Lacey Act made it unlawful to import birds or animals without a permit. It also prohibited the import of the mongoose and a couple of other specifically mentioned birds and any other birds or animals that the Secretary of Agriculture declared, declares to be injurious to the interest of horticulture or agriculture. And these importations were prohibited unconditionally, thus no permits could be issued for them. And at the time of enactment in 1900, Section 3 prohibited interstate transportation for unlawfully imported species and prohibited in interstate transportation of wildlife killed in violation of state territory uh, or the district where it was found. Um, between 1900 and 1960, there were various amendments. In 1939, in the context of amending the Migratory Bird Hunting Stamp Act, Congress stated that a central design of the Lacey Act was to prohibit shipment in interstate commerce of wildlife killed or shipped in violation of state laws, and then purported to extend the operation of the Lacey Act to foreign commerce in game and wildlife. And this language didn't speak to injurious species specifically. But then importantly, in 1948, Section 2 became Title 18, Section 42 of the United States Code and Section 3 became Title 18, Section 43 of the United States Code. And Section 42 continued to speak um, only to unlawful importations and importations requiring special permit, while Section 43 of the 1948 Amendments prohibited interstate transport for unlawfully imported species and prohibited interstate transport of wildlife killed in violation of state, territory, or other laws. Now, then the act was amended in 1960 to add the statutory language that was at issue in the U.S. ARC litigation. Uh, the 1960 amendments added to Section 42 the language regulating the shipment of injurious species between the continental United States, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, or any possession of the United States. Um, specifically, 42, a1 states, the importation into the United States, any territory of the United States, the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, or any possession of the United States, or any shipment between the continental United States, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, or any possession of the United States, of and such other species of wild mammals, wild birds, fish, including mollusks and crustacea, amphibians, reptiles, brown tree snakes, or the offspring or eggs of any of the foregoing, which the Secretary of the Interior may prescribe by regulation to be injurious to human beings to the interest of agriculture, horticulture, forestry, or wildlife, or the wildlife resources of the United States is hereby prohibited. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service subsequently amended its regulations at 50 CFR 16.3 uh, in 1965, including very similar language. Um, and then also at the time that, that Congress amended Section 42 in 1960, Congress amended Section 43, and when describing the prohibition of interstate transportation of certain wildlife to read that whoever delivers, carries, transports, ships by any means, whatever, or knowingly receives for shipment to or from any state, territory, the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, any possession of the United States or any foreign country. And so um, that Section 43 is now codified at Title 16, USC, um, the United States Code, Section 3372. Um, next slide. 
Okay, so admittedly, the early interpretation of, of this provision was, was not clearly articulated. Um, in fact, the service first provided its interpretation of the shipment clause in 1982 when it listed the raccoon dog as an injurious species under Section 42A1. And the Fish and Wildlife Service's environmental assessment on the proposed listing contain language prohibiting the interstate transportation and clearly showed that the service did view this provision as prohibiting interstate transportation. However, the service listed a number of other species between 1960 and 1982 and none of them uh, provided an interpretation of the prohibition. However, however, beginning in 1989, the department began inserting language in rules listing species as injurious that purported to prohibit all interstate transportation of the listed species. And the service's interpretation was communicated to Congress through testimony on various bills after 1990, and legislative history since that time has indicated that Congress understood the Lacey Act to prohibit interstate transportation between the continental states. In 2012 and again in 2014, Congress enacted legislation to exempt from the Lacey Act water transfers by a facility moving water containing injurious zebra mussels and other injurious species between Texas and Oklahoma. And this legislation obviously wouldn't have been necessary if transport of injurious species across state lines within the continental United States uh, was not prohibited. Legislative history associated with these exemptions also confirms that Congress understood the Lacey Act to prohibit transport of injurious species between states within the continental United States. So, prior to this litigation, the service had been interpreting the Lacey Act to prohibit the transport of injurious species across state lines within the continental United States for about 30 years. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, on January 23rd, um, in 2012, the service published a final rule listing three species of non-native pythons and one non-native anaconda as injurious under the Lacey Act. Um, and in that rulemaking, the service stated that by taking this action, it was prohibiting the importation into the United States and interstate transportation between the states the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, or any territory or position, possession of the United States, except by permit. The U.S. ARC filed a lawsuit then in December 2013 challenging that rule, and the complaint alleged four separate counts. Um, one, that the 2012 rules prohibition on interstate transportation of listed snakes was ultra-virus under the Lacey Act or, or beyond the scope of its powers. Um, two, that the service failed to take a hard look at the environmental consequences of listing the snake as required under uh, NEPA, under the National Environmental Policy Act. Three, that the service should have prepared an environmental impact statement under NEPA and four, that the service acted arbitrarily and capriciously in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act in deciding to list the four species of constrictors. <clears throat> uh, U.S. ARC was later granted leave to file a second amended complaint, which added, um, added a challenge to another, a new 2015 rule listing an additional four constrictor species. Um, <clears throat> And that second amended complaint also added four individual plaintiffs and a, a claim under the Regulatory Flexibility Act. Uh, next slide. So on April 1st, 2015, U.S. ARC filed an application for a temporary restraining order asking the court to enjoin the service's implementation of the 2015 rule as applied to the two of the species, to the reticulated python and, and the green anaconda, um, which was the rule was scheduled to take effect on April 9th, 2015. Um, their application for a TRO raised only the challenge to the scope of the Lacey Act 
injurious wildlife provision and the Regulatory Flexibility Act claim. So that was all that was before the court. <clears throat> At a hearing, the court denied the application for the temporary restraining order, but converted U.S. ARC's filing to a motion for a preliminary injunction and ordered a supplemental briefing. So, in that briefing, the government argued first that the claims were time barred. They they said that the service had been interpreting the Lacey Act in this manner for a number of years, certainly more than six years, and so plaintiffs had notice and their claim was barred by the statute of limitations. Um, alternatively, the government argued that the plain language of Section 42A1 supported the service's interpretation. Uh, we argued that Congress's use of or in the in the statutory language affords each um, each listed locality independent significance, such that shipments of injurious wildlife are prohibited between each one including shipments between the United States. And we argue that the District of Columbia is listed separately because Congress wanted to include each political entity that is potentially involved in the interstate commerce of injurious species. And we we said that, you know, under US ARC's reading of 42A1, an individual that was transporting listed wildlife from Virginia to Maryland would violate the statute if he drove through the District of Columbia, but not if he drove around the Beltway. And we argue that that kind of distinction is unrelated to any conceivable purpose of the Lacey Act and would produce an absurd result. Um, we also argued that the purpose of the Lacey Act supports the service's interpretation of the Act's injurious wildlife provision. Um, one purpose of the Lacey Act is to regulate the introduction of American or foreign birds or animals in localities where they have not existed before. The Act states that the localities are the geographic entities that should be protected, not merely large territories like the entire continental United States or an entire insular territory. And to protect localities, Congress could not have intended to cabin the service's authority to prohibit only the transport of injurious wildlife from the District of Columbia, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and other U.S. territories to the continental United States. Um, and finally, we argued that even if the court were to find that uh, congressional intent in 1960 with respect to the transportation pro prohibition is not clear, Congress's actions since 1960 have ratified the service's interpretation of the prohibition. Um, we said that Congress's actions in 1990 and in 2010 amending Section 42A1 to add the zebra mussel and the Asian carp show that Congress intended to prohibit interstate transport of injurious wildlife from the Lacey Act, from the time the Lacey Act was first enacted. And there were also some questions as to whether or not the service should get deference if the court found the statute was ambiguous, given that this was a criminal statute versus a civil statute. Um, we argue that there's no distinction between criminal laws and civil laws that, that call for criminal penalties, and the service's reasonable interpretation would require deference in that case. Next slide. So, unfortunately, on May 12, 2015, the district court found that U.S. ARC was likely to succeed on the merits of its claim, challenging the service's long-standing interpretation of the statutory prohibition against interstate transport of injurious species between states within the continental United States. And they enjoined the service from implementing and enforcing the Lacey Act's uh, transport prohibition for the reticulated python and the green anaconda within the continental U United States, except for transport into Texas and Florida. If you remember, those were the only two species that they had brought into their motion for preliminary injunction. Um, first, the court found that the government's position that the action was time bar barred was seriously flawed. I believe those were exact words. 
it noted that the, the final agency action at issue was the promulgation of a 20, 2015 rule. And in any event, the rule reopened the question of whether or not the department's interpretation of the relevant Lacey Act provision is correct. And the suit was thus held, the suit was timely filed. Um, the court then questioned whether or not Chevron deference would apply whether the service should should get deference if it found the statute ambiguous. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of an echo pushback. Um, but it ended up saying it didn't need to reach that issue since the court did not find the statute am, am, ambiguous to be ambiguous. Um, while the court found that the plain language of the Lacey Act did not compel either side's interpretation. It noted, it did note that Congress used very different language to prohibit the interstate transportation of certain wildlife species in Section 43 of the 1960 Lacey Act amendments. Um, and it, it said that, you know, it could have used that clear language to, to prohibit the interstate shipment um, under Section 42 as well. And the fact that it did not was an indication that Congress did not intend uh, the prohibition on statements under Section 42 to reach as broadly as the services interpretation would have it. Um, the district court relied heavily on the legislative history. And here it found that the legislative history of the 1960 amendments unambiguously quote unquote supported uh, plaintiff's position and the court relied on a Department of Interior staff testimony and other statements in the legislative history to find that the amended language in 1960 was not intended to dramatically expand the scope of conduct prohibited under the Lacey Act. Um, before the 1960 amendments, the Lacey Act barred importation into the United States or any territory or district, but did not address their domestic transportation and, and said that Fish and Wildlife Service's interpretation would have Congress criminalizing a broad range of activity as opposed to merely clarifying certain provisions as uh, testimony in House and Senate reports suggested. The court also found the narrow reach of the 1960 amendments to be confirmed by the Department of Interior's interpretations in the two decades following its enactment, so um, up until before, you know, 1982 to 1989 when it started um, voicing its interpretation consistently. The court did acknowledge that subsequent enactments show that con recent Congresses have understood that the Lacey Act prohibits transport of injurious species between states within the United continental United States. And this includes two times where Congress has amended Section 42A to add injurious species on its own in the one situation where Congress passed legislation specifically to exempt a facility engaged in water transfers containing zebra mussels uh, between Texas and Oklahoma. Um, nonetheless, the court rejected the government's argu arguments that Congress ratified the agency's interpretation because it had already concluded that the meaning of the Lacey Act's relevant language was clear at the time of its enactment in 1960. Um, the court also addressed and dismissed the argument that the Lacey Act prohibition was implicitly amended through Congress's subsequent amendments to add the zebra mussel and big head carp and then an enacted legislation to exempt certain water transfers between Texas and Oklahoma. In doing so, however, the court acknowledged that the question is close on whether Congress's amendment of the Lacey Act to add the big head carp impliedly admitted the Lacey Act and conceded that it was evident that the principal purpose of the 2010 amendment to add the big head carp was to prohibit interstate transportation of big head carp. However, the court continued to rely on what it said was a, a lack of information in the legislative history indicated, indicating that Congress intended to criminalize the interstate transportation of all spe 
species as opposed to just the big head carp currently listed under the Lacey Act. Um, next slide. Okay, so now with the district court's decision, reticulated pythons and green anacondas could be transported without any meaningful restrictions throughout the continental United States, except to and from the District of Columbia and into Texas and Florida. Um, while the order precluded the two species from being transported into Florida and Texas, pets and other animals in captivity could still escape or be released and survive in adjoining states long enough to migrate south into Florida and Texas where they might find long-term suitable climate conditions and habitat. Um, so there were strong concerns about um, the service's ability to prevent those efforts. And also, you know, the the court's order was limited to named plaintiffs and members of US ARC um, organization, but US ARC is not a small organization. So again, there was strong concern that this decision would pose a severe impact on the service's ability to prevent um, the establishment and spread of injurious species that have already been imported into the United States. And, you know, also the government believed that the court got it wrong, that the court erred in finding that plaintiffs were likely to succeed on the merits of their statutory interpretation claim. And so as a result of, of these concerns and these findings, the government appealed to the DC circuit. And the government again argued that the plain language of section 42 support the services interpretation that the legislative history shows that Congress intended to prohibit the interstate transportation of injurious wildlife from the time the Lacey Act was enacted. And alternatively, we argued that Congress ratified or impliedly amended Section 42A1 to comport with the services interpretation um, with its activities related to the zebra mussels and big head carp. And finally, we argued that, you know, even if the court does find the statute to be ambiguous, the services interpretation is entitled to deference. Um, so then, uh, again, unfortunately, on April 7th in 2017, uh, the D.C. Circuit upheld the district court's decision and went further than that. It actually reached a definitive judgment on the shipment clause's meaning. It held that uh, the service lacks the authority under Title 18, Section 42A1, to prohibit shipments of injurious species between the continental states. The DC Circuit found that this provision was unambiguous um, and found that its interpretation of this provision was consistent with the legislative history. And specifically, it held that U.S. ARC's interpretation was mandated by the grammatical structure, stating that the words between, when used to introduce multiple items, so between the United States, the District of Columbia, et cetera, um, speaks to the relationship across the listed items and not to the relationship within any one of the listed items. Um, and it essentially said that the use of or later in the clause could not overcome this fact. So they they spent actually several pages giving the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, a lesson in grammar, it seemed. Um, they also, they found that their interpretation was consistent with the evolution of the Lacey Act, noting that the 1960 amendments that added this this language in question were just meant to broaden the uh, statutory language, the existing statutory language a bit. And they noted that Congress could have used the same language um, that it did when it amended uh, Section 43, uh, but it did not. And the court found that the government's arguments as to ratification and implied amendments 
could not overcome the plain language of the act. And the court stated then that as a matter of law, the government lacks authority under the shipment clause to prohibit shipments of injurious species between the continental United States. Um, so now, uh, because of this decision existing in future injurious wildlife listings, including those that were listed or have been listed by Congress through statutes, uh, will no longer result in a statutory prohibition on interstate transportation of injurious wildlife between states within the continental United States. And that's that's my summary of the the decision. And again, we uh, there are folks from the Fish and Wildlife Service if there are questions as to how the service is responding and implementing this decision. Thank you very much, Helen. That was interesting. We should have all been listening better in grammar in our grammar <laughs> classes. I know, right? Um, let's see if we've got questions here. Um, I think this one might be for Stephanie. Um, and please go ahead and type your questions in if you have questions for any of our presenters. Can you provide more details about what is covered in the MOUs? Oh, um, yes. So we actually have just started the process of working towards the MOUs. It, we think that they'll primarily focus on laying out the kind of boundaries for uh, what states think have to be included in programs in like both states to move forward. So for instance, we would anticipate they would include things about what type of training or how much training uh, personnel should have. Uh, quality control requirements might be in an MOU. Um, there would definitely be like documentation requirements. For instance, um, there's a lot of challenges when boats move across state lines if they haven't been issued a receipt that provides the inspection history of the vessel. So definitely if two states want to work together, they need to have some sort of standard documentation so that the inspectors can talk to each other. So that's the type of um, issues that the MOUs would try to work out so that states would know um, kind of what's expected for them to make uh, their partnership work. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I have a question for Helen or her group there. So this is dealing with um, the federal laws then, but individual states can prohibit shipment of different species into their state or across their state line. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Okay, that is all the questions that I see for now. Um, this has been recorded and it will be available on both the NESAW and the National Invasive Plant Council websites by the end of the week. Thank you very much to all of our presenters. Appreciate the time and effort that you've put into this today. And I appreciate all of your patience with uh, our, the glitches that we experienced there for, for a bit. And we will see you tomorrow for the um, next presentation tomorrow at four. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.